However, if you look at, for example, the CIPRI think tank in Stockholm produced figures for defence spending last year, uh, 2009, they, they just came out a few months ago. Interestingly, despite the economic crisis around the world, or at least in the West, global defence spending has gone up 6%, 5.9% actually to be precise. If you look at the top 10 defence spenders in the world, uh, European countries like Britain, France, Germany, Italy are falling down the list relative to India, China, and indeed Saudi Arabia. And I, you may have seen a headline even just a couple of weeks ago in the Financial Times, where they, there was a story that a number of Gulf states, and in particular Saudi Arabia, were planning to buy, I think it's 123 billions worth of American military technology and equipment. 123 billion. The EU27 spend 30 billion euro a year, only 30 billion euro a year of their 200 billion on equipment. I mean, it really puts us in the halfpenny place. So, while our defence spending is going down, everyone else's is going up. And this is bound to change uh, the international security environment that we face. Now, I would argue, and I stand, I'm very happy to stand corrected in Vilnius on this, but from, according to opinion polls, most Europeans, most citizens of the EU27, for the most part, do not see a major military threat from another state. Now, I'm well aware that Russia can be a nuisance. I'm well aware of the difficulties Russia has caused some member states, for example, on energy supplies, cyber security. But is it a military threat is a key question. For that matter, would, it, would a nuclear-armed Iran be a direct military threat? Would the European citizens see a nuclear-armed Iran as a military threat? I'm not convinced they would. Some governments might. In the city I work in Paris, there are French defense planners who really do see an Iranian, uh, a nuclear-armed Iran as a military threat, but I'm not sure many European citizens would. But saying all that, that's not the way the rest of the world sees things necessarily. Um, let me put it another way. Can we really exclude the possibility of a major interstate war in the next 20 to 30 years? Uh, we won't necessarily stay stuck in our current crisis management paradigm forever, given the dramatic changes that are going on in the global economy, and as I've just said, in military spending. And I would say that the real focus for international security over the next 20 to 30 years will be in Asia. And, you know, if you look, I've mentioned already the increases in defense spending, especially in naval assets, protecting trade routes and energy resources. The, Asia basically has huge potential for strategic trouble, whether it's between China and India, China and Russia, uh, or if you even think about, for example, in the Middle East, because of course we should include the Middle East and Asia, if you think about Iran-Iraq, if Iran really did get a nuclear weapon, or Iran-Saudi Arabia. There's huge potential for strategic trouble in Asia and the Middle East. Um, and of course, none of that means that the Europeans will fight in a major interstate war. I'm not suggesting that for a second. The Europeans are not an Asian power. We're just not. You know, I, I'm not sure many people in Asia really care what we think about the North Korean nuclear program. Uh, we only have observer status, as far as I'm aware, in the ongoing talks in that process. Uh, but the United States is an Asian power, and that's why it matters to us. If you look at the latest American national security strategy, it's pretty clear. I mean, President Obama himself describes himself as America's first Pacific president. It's very clear that the focus is moving towards Asia, along with the Middle East and East Asia in particular. Um, you know, so the key question then for the Europeans is, if the United States is more focused on Asia uh, and less focused on European security, um, and if, if there's a crisis in our neighborhood that requires a military response, and the United States cannot or does not want to respond to that crisis, but we feel it's in our interest to do so, then it'll have to be the European Union. So this change in the US strategic focus could have huge implications for European security and for what the EU might be doing. Because if the United States isn't doing it, then it's not NATO. Then it has to be the European Union. Uh, I mean, I did get asked once, just to give you an anecdote, uh, I was part of a delegation meeting, an official Chinese delegation a couple of years ago, and they had asked me uh, to give a presentation about the basic concepts of EU security and defense policy. 
and quite naturally, and it gives you a sense of the mindset, because not everyone in the world is postmodern uh, like us Europeans. Uh, but the one Chinese official, he asked me, uh, what are the EU plans for defending the Straits of Hormuz? And at that stage, the sweat was starting to pour down my brow, I'll tell you, because obviously this is a very sensitive subject. But I had to tell him, well, we don't have any. We're not in the business of fighting wars. We don't think about interests the way you do. Uh, because we think about the rule of law, we think about our values along with our interests. That's not to say we don't think about our interests at all. And that's not to say NATO doesn't have plans. I'm not aware whether they do or they don't, by the way. That's not to say some member states haven't thought about it on a national level. Uh, again, I'm not aware whether they have or they haven't. But I'm pretty certain the EU has no plans for defending the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, but the Chinese are thinking about it, though. The Americans are obviously thinking about it. The Indians are thinking about it. So this is the kind of world we may be facing in the future. Uh, I'm not saying it's definite that we'll have an interstate war, by the way. But if you're a defense planner, you have to start thinking about the worst case scenarios because it's a de facto arms race that's going on in Asia today. Now, I've mentioned this change in the US strategic outlook and how Europe, frankly, is less important than it used to be. Uh, but what do I mean by our neighbourhood? I said that the European Union would be the organisation that would be expected to step up to the plate to respond to crises if NATO can't, meaning if the United States can't. But what do I mean by neighbourhood? Because it's important to define that. I don't just mean the Balkans or the Caucasus uh, or indeed uh, Moldova or Belarus. I would also include Africa, indeed the Indian Ocean, the Arctic Circle. Uh, in the French Livre Blanc, uh, their security and defense white paper in 2008, they have a very nice map describing what, how they see the geographic future of French defense policy. And it basically goes all the way around the Atlantic, through Russia, down to the Middle East, into the Indian Ocean, through Africa. All that circle. And that's pretty much what I would see as the geographic priority for the EU as well. I think that's where most of our interests are. And if you just think, for example, how many people three years ago would have said that the European Union would send ships to the waters off Somalia? Hardly anyone. I think if you had suggested that, you would have been laughed out of the room, frankly. Well, today, the European Union not only has an operation off the waters of Somalia to curb piracy, to protect trade routes, uh, but it's also coordinating the efforts of Chinese, Russian, American, Japanese, Australian, and other nationalities, all their boats as well. Uh, this is the kind of change we're seeing. And indeed, if you look at the 24 EU operations, all of them except maybe two, Aceh in Indonesia and Afghanistan, have taken place in that circle. So 22 out of the 24. So this fits in with the strategic trend. Uh, now, while I'm suggesting that there may be more requirement for more uh, autonomous EU operations in the future, I'm not saying that NATO won't do anything either. I'm not saying it's absolutely certain the United States won't. And I'm also not saying that every crisis will require a military response. It's very important to remember that. I mentioned the 3Ds much earlier uh, about 24 hours ago at this stage. Uh, but it's very important to remember the EU does also deploy civilians, not just uh, soldiers. If you think about the EU's response to the Georgia crisis in 2008, the United States, for a variety of reasons, wasn't able to lead the response at that stage. The French presidency under President Sarkozy did, and it deployed monitors. Now, of course, we can argue about how effective the Geneva process has been since then, but it was surprising for many people that the EU managed to react so quickly. But again, it was in our neighborhood, but not necessarily a military response. So it all fits in with a strategic trend. Um, more generally, um, because I will say a couple of things about operations in a second, but I do want to say a quick word about the specific threats and challenges that the EU will be dealing with. I mentioned some general drivers of change and threats, of, threats and challenges because we do have a European security strategy which EU governments agreed in 2003 and it lists things like terrorism, organized crime, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, uh, regional conflicts, and we've added a few things since in 2008. We did a review of the implementation of the security strategy and we added things like cybersecurity, climate change, migration, and so on. That's all fine. The problem is, where do military forces fit into the response to these challenges? Because for most Europeans, actually, they don't fit in with countering terrorists. That's a law enforcement issue. Nor do they with organized crime. That's, again, a law enforcement issue. Uh, WND proliferation 
well, the EU is not going to bomb Iran. You know, the EU will support international treaties and will try and get more countries to sign up to treaties curbing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, but we're not going to fight a war, uh, and certainly not against Iran. Uh, so the main issue for the EU, the main focus at the moment, has been regional conflicts and failed states, like in the Balkans, for example. Uh, and so that's where the operational focus will be for external operations. Okay, uh, so that fits in with the patterns I've described. However, there's another maybe new element, and this is uh, relatively recent, and it's partly because of the, uh, you've had very similar debates in NATO during the strategic concept process. Because, of course, a number of member states, they're getting tired of international peacekeeping. They're facing huge budget cuts. The experience in Afghanistan, which has taken up most member states' resources for expeditionary operations, has not always been a happy one. Uh, so we may see more and more member states wanting to focus really on homeland defense or territorial defense. Uh, there are many different ways of looking at the concept, depending on whether you really think you face a state-based threat. The point for the EU is, will this become more of a theme for EU defense in the future? because in the Lisbon Treaty, we do have two clauses, the Mutual Assistance Clause, which suggests we should be able to cooperate, or at least some of us should be able to cooperate uh, to cope with internal security problems. And we have the Solidarity Clause, which is very specific about responding to a terrorist attack uh, or indeed natural disasters, and mentions that the EU could have the possibility to try and coordinate military forces uh, for an internal response as well. So this internal role of EU defence policy may start becoming more important over the next five years, I suspect, uh, for the reasons I mentioned, for political reasons and for budgetary reasons. Uh, but if we're looking at the external operations, I mean, obviously every conflict and every crisis is different, so that means every operation is a bit different, but there's a few characteristics, and this applies to NATO as much as it does to the EU, by the way. One is, well, maybe the first one less so, but that's what we can debate. One is, the first likely condition for the EU, for EU operations in the future is they'll be very much focused on the neighbourhood. I think that will remain the case in the future as they have been so far. There will obviously be coalitions, but the interesting point about coalitions now is, it used to be common to say and to think that you know the UK and France are able to run national operations. All other member states have to run them through coalitions anyway for expeditionary operations through the UN, through NATO, or through the EU. But given the budget cuts that the UK and France are going through now, even they would have difficulty. You know, the UK would no way be able to fight a Falklands war today the way it did in 1982. Absolutely no way. So they will have to be part of coalitions as well. I suppose the key question is, will they be NATO or will they be EU coalitions? The third point is operations will increasingly be hybrid. I've mentioned how the EU has deployed civilians and military, but only once or twice have they deployed them together. And of course, if you really want to deal with a crisis at different times in the crisis cycle, you need to know when to deploy soldiers, when to deploy police, when to deploy administrators, customs officials, and development workers. And you need to make sure they all work together for the same aims. It's not an easy thing to do. NATO has had huge difficulty as well in Afghanistan with this, but NATO doesn't have the access to the development resources that the EU has uh, and to the diplomatic cloud in the same way that the EU has. And that's a big, big difference. NATO doesn't have access to police. It does have access to gendarmerie because they come under the control of defence ministries, but not to police. Whereas again, the EU has that and judges and more. And the fourth likely condition is partnerships. Uh, I'm very happy to discuss the EU-NATO relationship later. Uh, I've already mentioned cooperation with the United Nations and why that matters for Ireland, but it's not just about other organisations. It's also about the rising powers. I mentioned how for the operation of Somalia, we're working with the Chinese, the Indians, the Americans, uh, and the Russians, for example. Uh, it would have been very difficult for us for the European Union to run its operation in Chad without Russian helicopters. Uh, or indeed a country like Turkey, which is not yet a member. Uh, those contributions will become increasingly important. Uh, 